John Newton knew every one of them. John Newton memorized every one of them. And just to quote you one of those verses, Ephesians 2, 8, it is by grace that we are saved by faith, not that of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, least anyone should boast. But John Newton didn't all of a sudden become a born-again Christian and sit down and write the song Amazing Grace. John Newton didn't write the song Amazing Grace until 25 years later. No, John Newton continued in the slave trade business. He would be up on the deck of the ship reading and studying his Bible, while down below would be over 200 slaves packed in like sardines. Usually one-third would not survive the voyage. They were pulling to the port of Charleston, South Carolina during the 1760s, and while they were unloading the slaves, selling the slaves, disposing of the dead slaves, John Newton would be in some church conversing the Bible. No, John Newton continued in the slave trade business, and he didn't get out on his own. He was struck down by God just like Paul. You know, the prodigal son didn't come home because he had a feeling of guilt or a sense of responsibility. The prodigal son came home because he was desperate. He had nowhere else to turn except to the father. Well, Paul didn't become a born-again Christian because all of a sudden he got this feeling. Paul was on the road to Damascus. Paul was on the way to persecute more Christian Jews when he was struck down by God. Temporarily blinded, temporarily helpless, God was speaking to Paul. When Paul witnessed the stoning of Stephen and Stephen's face shone like an angel, that bothered Paul. He couldn't get it out of his mind. The other thing that bothered Paul, when he was persecuting Christian Jews, they would be praying for him. And Paul did not understand that, and that bothered Paul. Yeah, God was talking to Paul, but Paul wasn't listening. Paul had his own agenda. Well, John Newton's getting ready for another voyage. This time he's more excited than ever. This time he's going to be captain of the ship. But a day before the ship leaves port, John Newton is struck down by God with an epileptic seizure. And for a while, he's helpless. His slave trade days are over. And because of his condition, the owners of the ship had to find another captain. And John Newton was deeply disappointed. But four days after the ship leaves port, there's a slavery boat. And the captain of the ship is killed. And so are some of the members of the crew. And John Newton knew that should have been him. That's the fourth time his life had been spared. And for a while, John Newton is lost. The only business he knew was the slave trade business. He's able to get some work as a surveyor, and then because of his knowledge and passion of the Bible, he was asked to preach. And he preaches to age 81, a year before he dies. And it was during these years of preaching that he began to see, that he began to realize the sins that he had committed being in the slave trade business. And it gave him guilt. He couldn't find peace. He would even have nightmares at night. But it was also during these years of preaching that John Newton wrote 284 songs. And he would use these songs to introduce his sermons on Sunday mornings. Well, on New Year's Eve, 1772, he wrote the song Amazing Grace. And on New Year's Day, 1773, he used the song Amazing Grace to introduce his sermon. And the sermon he preached on was 1 Chronicles chapter 17. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, David is speaking to God. And David is saying, why me, God? Why me? Why are you blessing me? I'm a murderer. I'm an adulterer. Why are you blessing me? And that's the same thing John Newton was saying. Why me, God? Why are you blessing me? And at age 63, after a long, hard struggle, John Newton finally completes a 10,000-word essay, which was his confession in writing. And the name of this essay was Thoughts of an African Slave Trader. And when he finally completed this essay, he had peace. You've heard the saying, confession is good for the soul? Well, it was certainly good for John Newton. But meanwhile, the song Amazing Grace drifts on. It makes a few hymn books. It's become one of, my, one of many popular hymns. And back during those days, when they would write a hymn, they would try to find a tune to go with the hymn. There were over 20 different tunes put with Amazing Grace before we finally have the one we have today. And the one we have today, we credit uh, Mr. Wesley Walker. Mr. Walker was a musician, and Mr. Walker wrote the tune in 1829. But the last verse of Amazing Grace was not added in 1909. 
Of course, John Newton never heard it. He had been dead over 100 years. The last verse was added by Mr. Edmund XL. Mr. Edmund XL was a music composer, but Mr. XL did not write the verse. Mr. XL found the verse in a book, a book written in 1852. 1852, the same year the public were allowed to see that famous painting, The Return of the Prodigal. And some of you may have read the book. Some of you may have studied about the book in American history in high school. The name of the book was Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Uncle Tom's Cabin was given credit for starting the Civil War. And Uncle Tom's Cabin was written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And Harriet Beecher Stowe was raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. And in 1850, Cincinnati, Ohio was a frontier town located on the Ohio River, the river that separates Ohio from the great state of Kentucky. But also in 1850, Cincinnati, Ohio was a stopping off place for the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad, the railroad that brought the runaway slaves out of the south into the north. And Harriet Beecher Stowe's father was president of Lane Theological Seminary. And because of who her father was and because of who she was, Harriet Beecher Stowe had the opportunity to meet the slaves, get to know the slaves, hear their stories, see their scars. And then in 1851, Harriet Beecher Stowe's six-month-old daughter, Julie, died of the colic. And Harriet Beecher Stowe went into a state of depression. And during her period of grief, she began to realize that how hard it was for the African slave women to have their babies taken away from them at such a young age. And that inspired her to write the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Uncle Tom's Cabin was about a slave named Tom and his master named Simon LaCree. And Tom taught himself to read. And he began to read the Bible. And he became a born-again Christian. He wanted to teach the other slaves to read. He wanted to teach the other slaves Christianity. But Simon LaCree did not want his slaves to learn to read. Simon LaCree did not want his slaves to think for themselves. So Simon LaCree demanded that Tom renounce his Christianity. And Tom refused. So Simon LaCree had Tom beaten to death. And while Tom was dying, he started singing the song, Amazing Grace. And this is when Harriet Beecher Stowe added that last verse, that verse we've heard so many times, that verse we've sung so many times. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we know less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, spread like wildfire. It became a bestseller. People felt like they knew Tom. They despised Simon LaCree. They got very passionate about it. And they began to demand an end of slavery. And a few years later, slavery was abolished. And after the Civil War, and before Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Harriet Beecher Stowe had the opportunity to meet Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln said to her, and I quote, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that started the war. And she replied to him, and I quote, I cannot take credit for it. It was written by God himself. I was merely his instrument. But meanwhile, the song Amazing Grace keeps drifting on. It makes a few more hymn books. It's being sung by some of the gospel groups. It was even sung by Martin Luther King and his followers when they were marching through Selma, Alabama. And then in December 1970, December, right around Christmas, Christmas, Jesus' birthday, a folk singer by the name of Judy Collins makes a recording of Amazing Grace. And less than a month later, January 1971, the song Amazing Grace is on top of the charts in America. It's on top of the charts in England. And even today, Judy Collins swears that the song Amazing Grace cured her of her alcoholism. And Judy Collins is only one of many whose lives have been changed by the song Amazing Grace. And after Judy Collins sang the song Amazing Grace, it's been sung by so many, just to name a few that sung it in the beginning. Elvis Presley, Dolly Parton, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Aretha Franklin, Mahala Jackson, Rod Stewart, Sam Cooke. It goes on and on and on. It's been recorded over 6,500 times. 
That might not mean much, but most songs are only recorded once, some twice, some five times, some ten times, some maybe a hundred, but no song's ever been recorded even close to 6,500 times. It's the most listened to song ever written. Three times it was on the National Olympics broadcast worldwide. Three times it was sung <coughs> at the George Bush inauguration broadcast worldwide. It was sung before 4,000 people at the Washington National Cathedral paying tribute to the victims of 9-11 broadcast worldwide. I don't know how many times it's been sung by Bev Shea on the Billy Graham Crusades. It's sung over 10 million times every year at different functions. And just think, it was written over 258 years ago by a former slave trader. But it never would have been written without the influence of Paul. It never would have been written without the influence of the greatest story ever told. It's the greatest song ever written. And when you sing it in church, you usually stand a little taller, sing a little louder, feel a little closer to heaven. Some people say this whole scenario was orchestrated by God. And as Paul Harvey used to say, now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Paul. We thank you for John Newton. We thank you for the song Amazing Grace. We thank you for the greatest story ever told. And we especially thank you for your amazing grace. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. See why I wanted you to hear that today? Isn't that amazing? Thank you, Kenny. Now let's stand and sing that song, Amazing Grace, 378.